I grew up in a small town in Arkansas, and my first exposure to computing was at a summer physics camp at the University of Arkansas. And like lots of people, I had ambitions to be a physicist, but I was captivated by this computer center concept. And the notion that you could take um, mathematical equations and bring them to life on this machine and see the dynamics. I remember plotting, you know, the trajectory of a bouncing ball on the plotter. It was just this incredible thing. The notion that you could, um, you could make science come alive and that the machine could be a mechanism to look at, at interesting phenomena. And I knew after that, that experience that I'd found a calling in my life. There's nothing else like that. There's everything from how we think about the interconnectedness of climate change and human endeavor to as we think about the explosive growth of data and, and biology and biomedicine and as we really try to claim the, the repeated promise of personalized medicine, uh, not just in a reactive sense, but in a preventive sense, so we can do wellness care, not just uh, treating disease. And computing lets us explore this, this great space of data, and perhaps more importantly, lets us bring together models that span multiple disciplines. Um, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that most of the problems that we care about lie at the intersections of traditional disciplines. And so, as we think about software and building models that span time and space scales, that bring diverse communities together, there are a bunch of deep technical challenges there in computing at large and high performance computing. And there are also challenges about how we make it possible for a broader group of people to access computing. So years ago I wrote an essay about how easy to use tools might make it possible for a group of undergraduates to attack an urban planning question. And the question in some sense was if we changed the way that we generate electrical energy in a major city, what would it do for telecommuting? What would it affect in the way that we build the transportation system? How would it affect the environment in that city? And perhaps equally importantly, how would the effluent from that city affect agriculture downwind in a neighboring place? The point being not do you bring together a group of advanced graduate students with point expertise in each of those disciplines, but how do you bring together a group of undergraduates who have sort of broad liberal arts and science and technology education but aren't experts in any one of those disciplines, and let them ask and answer an interesting question like that so that they have easy to use tools that fuse data that's drawn from broadly available public sources, high performance computing to run those models, easy to use visualization interfaces so they can, they can do gesture and interaction and ask what if questions, explore possibilities, and see the effects uh, of those possibilities on the possible outcomes so they could understand the interactions of the policies and possible outcomes. The reason that's important is that the ease of use issue and the fact that they can immediately get engaged in those kind of questions is a motivation for why you might need to understand the partial differential equations that define uh, atmospheric circulation or downstream effluent and how it affects agriculture. If you see that motivation and you see those opportunities, then you have the rationale to say, yes, I need to understand the science more deeply. I need to know how the computing make those things possible. But in the end, people care about technology for what it lets them do. Those of us in the technology business have to remind ourselves regularly, we're the minority. We love the technology because it's cool. Most people love the technology because it lets them do amazing things. Making sure that's the first message then pulls people into the science. I spent my whole professional life in high performance computing. Uh, I had the good fortune to build in the university environment some of the largest computing infrastructures for research that we've ever built on this planet. And I had great pride in working with wonderful scientists and computing folks to put that together. But I came to Microsoft because there was an amazingly interesting challenge there. Uh, I've historically said that I was a big iron HPC guy. When I came to Microsoft, I realized there was a whole nother scale of big. 
As we think about extreme computing and the infrastructure that powers clouds, it's orders of magnitude bigger than what exists in the technical computing space. So I sometimes say I've got the greatest job in the world because I get to take a blank sheet of paper and try to reinvent computing at this interesting confluence of massive cloud infrastructure, the hardware and software that goes behind that. How often do you get an opportunity to say, take a blank sheet of paper, rethink what it means to build the largest computing infrastructure humanity's ever seen? One of the things that's happened over the, the last decade as we've looked at the way um, research agencies have built what's now called cyber infrastructure, uh, the, the computing technology to enable computer-mediated scientific discovery and data analysis, we've seen a proliferation of locally hosted infrastructure. The best thing and the worst thing that's happened about inexpensive computing the best thing is it's now broadly accessible. The worst thing is everyone has replicated infrastructure. So if you go to essentially any university and you ask the CIO or the chief research officer what's their biggest computing challenge, besides talking about the inevitable challenges of security and privacy, they will say, every door I open, every broom closet has got local infrastructure. I struggle with the power and cooling. I struggle with the management of those systems. How do I sustain this infrastructure? What we're doing with the National Science Foundation is exploring an alternative model, one that says, let's look at this convergence of clouds and desktops and mobile devices and HPC, leverage the fact that companies like Microsoft are building the largest computing capability the planet's ever seen, and let's focus on how we let scientists do what scientists want to do, which is research, not run infrastructure. And the model is, give them access to cloud infrastructure and technical computing tools that leverage not just the people who want to operate at the very highest end, because by definition those are a minority of the people, but the broad base of researchers who don't really want to know about computing, they don't want to know about technical computing, want to say, let me, let me analyze my data, let me run a model of, uh, of, of a virus spread or this, this biochemical process, or let me understand this engineering design. Uh, and I want to do it with the same tools that I've always used on my desktop. So we're making available a large amount of computing capability on Windows Azure, together with storage, together with high, band ac high bandwidth access. We're going to give that to the National Science Foundation, let them allocate it by peer review, and work with the research community to build tools atop that infrastructure targeted to science to try to transform the way computing infrastructure supports science, not only in the U.S., but in Europe and Asia as well. Computing is one of those things that's amazing. The, as I for many years told my students, who every time I was preparing an exam would say, can you give us copies of the old exams so we can study? And I always did, but I always warned them that the great and interesting thing about computing is the questions don't change, but the answers always do. The other advice I always gave students, which I inevitably did at the end of the semester after I had had many weeks to talk to them, is the advice I try to live by, which is, Life is short, you have to do what you love. If you love what you do, nothing else matters. If you don't love what you do, you should find something else to do. I have the most amazing job in the world. I get to go to work every day, work with incredibly smart people on amazing problems in science and technology. The technology aspects alone are fascinating because computing moves at an exponential pace. What was fast yesterday is the commonplace today. What is fast tomorrow is amazing. On the other hand, it's also interesting to look at how the technologies affect what people do and seeing the kinds of things that people do with the things you build is the other kind of satisfaction. So I, 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 I can't say enough about how, what a lucky guy I am. Mm -hmm.